that one. So my name is Michael Tarasso. I'm going to talk to you about iOS build and test infrastructure at Square. I work on the foundation team and am responsible for our main CI cluster. So what do we do exactly? Well, we make robots to build and test your app. Turns out these need to be magic robots because there are a lot of edge cases and a lot of trouble that we have to deal with in order to make these work. So our main goal is developer happiness. We want to make sure that you're able to tell very, very early on in your process of submitting a change whether or not you're breaking other people, whether or not you're causing regressions. We'd rather show you a red build or a progress bar than to have your day ruined by shipping a bug to production. So how do we do this? We have a whole bunch of servers we have to configure them. We have to get Xcode to behave on them. And we write a software layer so that developers can interact with the build system. So servers. Over the last nine months, we've revamped the iOS build infrastructure at Square. And one of the first things that we found out is that virtualization isn't the greatest thing for builds. The short answer to this is that builds involve a lot of small files and a lot of short-lived processes. And this is an easy way to overwhelm your scheduler and your VFS layer of your operating system. And when then you add the hypervisor in, which has a second layer of basically the same things, if they aren't working together, you can incur performance penalties pretty easily. So we went with bare metal. This is our hardware. We run on dual core Mac minis. We load them up with a bunch of RAM and solid state disks in order to make everything fast. We found this one cool trick for making the iOS build things fast. <laughs> which is fake HDMI monitors. So we plug one of these into the Mac minis, and it makes the iOS simulator use the graphics card rather than the software rendering. And it speeds up all of our tests by 10%. They cost $15 on Amazon. If you're running iOS build infrastructure, I highly recommend you grab one, <laughs> or several. So now we've got a whole bunch of servers. How do we get them all looking the same? Because we really would like it so that you build on one server. It's the same as building on the others. So we started with Deploy Studio. This is, the, this is a NetBoot solution for OS X. It's the NetBoot solution for OS X. Our IT department uses this to deploy all of our laptops, and it's been totally killer for deploying a bunch of Mac minis. We have the Xcode and the SDK installations on here, as well as OS X. We set up some special configuration for Xcode, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. The next thing we do to our machines is we run them through Ansible. Ansible is a configuration management system. If you don't know what that is, it is a way to write down in code the state you want a machine to be in, which also is a runnable form of it. So I can actually press a button and roll out a change to all of our OS X build slaves all at once. It's similar to things like Puppet and Chef, and it makes it really easy for us to add tools, change configuration, and even code review changes to our infrastructure. It's been super. We connect all these things to Jenkins. This isn't actually the logo for the Swarm plugin that we used to do this connection, but it really should be. Because the Swarm plugin for Jenkins allows us to avoid all of the web configuration around slaves. So machines just come up, they connect to Jenkins by themselves, if you are doing this at your, at your work, it's very tight with the Jenkins version. So every time you upgrade Jenkins, you have to upgrade the Swarm plugin. So we're going to talk a little bit about Xcode. I'm not the hugest fan of Xcode, mostly because I work on build infrastructure, so I don't get to see all the cool things that it does, like actually build apps. I just get to deal with it as a problem child when it doesn't want to do something from the command line. <laughs> so anyway, so how do we tame Xcode? Well, we start by taming OS 10. So I highly recommend that you run it. You run OS 10, the latest version of OS 10, with the latest version of Xcode. That's actually how they're tested at Apple, and it's how we run them in production all the time. Make sure your Macs never go to sleep. There's a handy command called caffeinate that ships with OS 10. It's very similar to the caffeine app that you may have on your laptop. It sets up a little thing called a power assert attached to a process, which bypasses all the confusing sleep settings on OS 10 and makes it so as long as the process is running, the machine stays up. It's really nice. Also, always have a GUI context. Xcode and the iOS simulator are way happier with a GUI context. We have an auto-logged-in user that actually provides us this. So there's a couple of 
sort of strange Xcode settings. I'm going to gloss over this quickly. There's a blog post coming out in the next couple weeks that is going to go into more detail on this. Uh, the TCC database actually allows accessibility access between different apps on OS X. You can poke this from the command line and get it so that Xcode and the iOS simulator can operate one another. And there's also this little command called DevTool Security that you need to run in order to get things set up. Um, we have a bunch of paranoia on our machines. We turn a whole bunch of things off just from a control standpoint of view. We want to make sure that if something goes sideways with a build, we don't have to go through all of these things and make sure that something didn't happen. So anyway, setting this up, it's a little bit difficult. Um, it's really easy to configure stuff on OS X from the GUI interface. So I want to share with you a quote that's on the cover of In the Beginning Was the Command Line, which is an excellent essay, but it's not about builds at all. A challenge to an icon-obsessed culture increasingly interposing itself between people in the physical world. Be that challenge when you're setting up machines on OS X. You will thank yourself later for your checked-in code that describes how to do this. And oftentimes you're like, oh man, I can't figure out how to do this without clicking a button. There is always a way. It might be a difficult way, but there is a way. So let's talk about software. So the software layer we write is essentially an interface to developers. We want to enable self-service. The simple way to do this is kind of a solved problem. Travis CI does this. Most other CI systems have some variant of this, which is that you've got checked-in configuration that tells you what are you building, and then there's some bit of release code that actually checks out your app, reads the config, and actually does the build. This isn't rocket surgery. This is a picture of some of our configuration files. I'm not sure how readable this is, but uh, this is one of our beta configs at the top. We specify a provisioning profile and the project and scheme that we're going to be running with near the top. And then on the bottom, we have the, uh, one of our debug configurations. And you can see at the bottom maybe that the, yeah, the SIM device type is iPad Retina, and the SIM runtime is iOS 8. That's what's going to be running your tests. So this isn't rocket surgery, but implementing it can be a little bit complicated. So how does it work? We start by versioning absolutely everything. So we version what version of CocoaPods is on the machine. We use Bundler to manage a bunch of different gems that are part of the release system. And the idea here is that we know exactly what we're building with. So the way I like to think about this is how often do components change? They can change very rarely, like your Ruby interpreter, Git, your version of OS X. Xcode changes a little bit more often. And then even more often, or on a per app basis, you've got things like your, the exact version of your iOS SDK, the exact version of CocoaPods that a particular app is going to want. So what we try to do is keep the, all the things that change rarely go get pushed back into the imaging process. And all the stuff that changes all the time comes up and is managed by either the release code or is pushed out to a per app configuration. Another thing that we have to do is code signing. So we actually have all of our, we actually have all of our releases automated at this point. So there are three parts to code signing. Entitlements, mobile provision profiles, and certificates. Certificates are the most secret part of all that as far as your company is concerned. So we push those all the way back in the imaging process. We try to hide them from people. Entitlements and mobile provision profiles are much more linked to the app. And so those become configuration. It's super important to set up just a single golden path for signing, because Xcode build will happily burn your toast, which is to say that it's perfectly happy to create an app given a chaotic mobile provision profile environment that will not run on any devices, which is just kind of sad. Luckily, you can give it only one, and it will only do that one thing, which is good. Um, a lot of the trouble with this is that it's not well known how to look inside of the files that are involved in code signing. So mobile provision profiles and signed IPAs and things of that nature are often like, oh, look, it looks like a bunch of gibberish, and maybe I can look at it in a text editor. This is a tool that a Square engineer, Eric Monty, made in his free time called Pliny. I 
highly recommend you check it out. It'll let you look inside these files. And you can get an idea of what sorts of decisions Xcode build is making. It's usually trying to be helpful. So anyway, the other thing that we do is we wrangle the iOS simulator. XC run SimCTL is what we use to manage all the aspects of the simulator. It's been getting a lot better since iOS, since, excuse me, Xcode 6. We make an absolutely new simulator every run with, an, with a new unique ID. And we restart everything between builds. So we actually will kill all the launch D processes associated with the simulator, just clear everything out in between. We also set a default to the iOS simulator app, telling it that the sim type that we're about to run is the one that it ran last. This helps prevent crashes. So a few quick statistics for this overhaul. Now that we have more machines, we're running three times as many tests on every pull request in register, which is pretty awesome. And our build stability has increased from 85% when we first started measuring it to 99.5. A quick note about this metric, this is how often when a build goes red, it is actually, and I'm going to mess this up, it is actually your fault. <laughs> there we go. OK. Um, so, so yeah, basically what this, what, this, what this is is the like, oh, yeah, hey, you clicked build, and it turned out red. And then it's like, no, 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 that keeps happening to everybody. Why does that? Yeah, that's fine. Just click run again. That doesn't happen in our system anymore. <laughs> um, there's a blog post that I wrote recently that's up on corner.squareup.com about this the process we used to get to this. Uh, it's actually very interesting. And seriously, our internal iOS build cluster is called MoBuild. And ask any Square iOS developer about MoBuild. I guarantee you they will say it's been much improved, mostly because they're all sitting here. And I just told them what they should say. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we still, have some, we still definitely have some room for improvement. That's about it for me. My name is Michael Tarasso. And this is how to get in touch with me, email, and on Twitter. We're hiring iOS engineers and also folks to do build and release stuff. So if this is your, if this is your area, I'd love to talk to you. And with that, I'm going to hand you off to Eric. Thanks, y'all. <laughs>